So anyhow, we stayed down at the low altitude, and then uh, he finished just before we got to Iwo Jima. And we got to Iwo Jima, and we made one circle of the island there, and uh, Chuck Sweeney joined us, and uh, George Marquardt, that, that's the instrument plane and the weather plane, uh, the, the uh, camera plane. We take off in Japan. I'll tell you right now, this was one of the easiest missions I ever flew in my life. The Japanese who had no opposition, nothing to, up, up, to fight back at high-flying airplanes. And we were going to be at one of the highest-flying airplanes they'd ever seen over, over the Empire of Japan at that time. Climbed very slowly. I could look out. I could see the coastline of Japan from a good hundred miles away. I could see the city of Hiroshima from a good 75 miles away. So we just went out on course right across the island of Shikoku, right across the Inland Sea to our initial point, which was about 12 miles east of Japan, east of Hiroshima. Made a left-hand turn because we wanted a bomb on a westerly heading. By that time, I had taken the wind drifts all off. I'd talked to the bombardier. We had the wind pretty well uh, 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 built into his bomb site and everything. Almost as soon as we turned onto the target, he could pick up the city of Hiroshima in his bomb site and extended vision. That, that just means he could crank the bomb site a little bit further forward than he normally could. We sat on that bomb run for at least two minutes. I know while we're on the bomb run, but Tom looked back at me and he says, Dutch, if we'd ever sat on a bomb run this long over Europe, we wouldn't be here. And I says, you're absolutely right. This is one of the advantages of flying over Japan versus flying over Europe uh, during that part of the war. Finally, the bomb left the airplane. I should point out the bombardier is flying this airplane through his bomb site. Uh, as, we're, as they were on a bomb run. Then the bomb lets the bomb leaves the airplane, 9,400 pounds that left the airplane all of a sudden, the plane surged. <coughs> Tibbet switched off the automatic pilot, goes into his turn to get away from the bomb. That, our maneuver to get away from the bomb was a 150 degree turn to the right, soon he was doing it to the left. Put the nose down about to lose 2,000 feet in the turn and just push the throttles forward, and run as fast as we could. Now, we were going away from the city of Hiroshima at that point. It took 43 seconds from the time the bomb left the airplane until it exploded about 1,800 feet above the ground. It exploded on a radar proximity fuse, about 1,800 feet above the ground. So the bomb would explode and blast, five, 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 down and sweep out. We all thought the bomb had been a dud. I think it's just adrenaline maybe making you count faster or do something. Suddenly there was a bright flash in the airplane, like a photographer's bulb going off in uh, a dark closet or something like that. So now we knew the bomb had worked. We kept on going away from it, and almost instantaneously the first shock wave hit us. Now that shock wave was measured at three and a half Gs. That doesn't seem like much if you're a fighter pilot flying a fighter plane at that altitude. But you're in a B-29 at 30,000 feet and you hit a three and a half G jolt. It's a pretty doggone good jolt. The sound was worse than a bite because it sounded like a piece of sheet metal that you would take and snap or something like that. Somebody called out Flack and the tail gunner called up and says it wasn't Flack. It was a shock wave and he says here comes another one. And by that time, the second one had hit us. This bomb set up visible shock waves, that very similar, I would imagine, to what did you see if you drop a pebble in a still pool of water? It ripples out and up. And that's what the bomb, bomb set up. And the tail gunner could sit back there and tell you almost exactly when they were going to hit the airplane. We kept going away until we were sure we weren't going to get any more shock waves. Then we turned around to take a look at what had happened. By that time, we took, could, by the time we turned around, that large white cloud you've all seen pictures of had fallen. It was up well above our altitude already. I guess it was up to 50,000 feet already. 
obviously a tremendous amount of energy had been released. He looked down below the cloud at the city of Hiroshima to make some observation about what was down there. You could make absolutely, could see absolutely nothing. Dust, the dirt, the dust, the smoke, everything else that was kicked up by the shock wave was hanging over the city, much like a large black cloud covering the entire city. So you can make no visual observation. So we flew a little bit in the southeast quadrant of the city, and we could see we weren't going to be able to make any visual observation. So we turned around and went home. And we get home, two, two things were different. Were, two things happened. Number one, they had a beer party where they're giving free beer and hot dogs. And I didn't get any free beer and a hot dog, but that's all right. <laughs> and that's number one. And number two, there are more generals and admirals there than I'd ever seen in one place in my life. If the Japanese had booked, could have bombed that particular place at that particular time, they'd have got almost every authoritative figure in, in the Pacific warfare except MacArthur and Nimitz. Those are the only, the only two people that weren't there. Oh, and LeMay wasn't there either. But everybody else was there. And the first time I'd ever been debriefed by a four-star admiral. <laughs>